All right, take a look at these DPS numbers. Option A, no modifiers, no buffs. Option B, top tier modifiers and offensive buffs galore. Which would you prefer? Hey there, my name is Salandrak and welcome to the next episode of my Terraria 1.4 Journey's End Beginner's Guide series. Today we're covering some game mechanics that, if you understand and utilize, will greatly increase your chances of success against your enemies and can often make all the difference between victory or defeat. As always, if you enjoy this type of content, please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe and let me know down in the comments if you have any questions. Now let's get to it! I've said it before in this series, but this is so important that the topic deserves its own guide. Terraria is a game where a lot of small benefits can cumulatively add up to huge overall impacts in your ability to survive and defeat your enemies. While the inherent features of your equipped items can certainly have a big impact on your effectiveness, another equally important factor is the modifiers those items can have, as well as the buffs that can be active on your character. So today we're going to take a deep dive into understanding those factors so you can put them to use as soon as possible. As I mentioned in the first guide in this series, most weapons and accessories have a 75% chance to be given a modifier when they are acquired, whether it's through crafting, loot from a boss mob or chest, or purchased from a vendor. Exceptions are items obtained directly from fishing and items given by the angler as rewards for completing fishing quests. These items always have no modifier when obtained, but can have a mod added later. All items that can have a modifier can have the modifier reforged by visiting the goblin tinkerer who is found randomly in the cavern lair after a goblin army has been defeated. For a fee, he will assign a new mod to an item which is completely random, and each possible mod has the same chance to get rolled as any other potential mod. In other words, you have just as good a chance at getting legendary on a sword as you do to get terrible or tiny. The cost for each reforge is a function of the item's base value and adjusted by the quality of the mod being replaced. So changing good mods is more expensive, but replacing bad mods costs less. Note that the discount card, a hard mode accessory dropped by pirates in the pirate invasion, will reduce the goblin's fees. Accessory mods are always good and can improve your character's defense, critical strike chance, damage, movement speed, melee attack speed, or maximum mana. Most of these increase the attribute by 1-4%, to exceptions being critical strike chance which only has 2 or 4% options, and defense which simply adds 1-4 to defense to your total. There's also the arcane mod that just adds 20 to your maximum mana, the equivalent of 1 additional mana star. For offensive accessory mods, menacing for 4% increased damage is generally the best, as it improves all damage types including summoned minions which can be used to supplement the damage of all builds unless you're being a purist and aren't using any. Increased crit chance is also perfectly decent in most situations, but because summoned minions can't crit and because enemy defense is applied before crit damage is calculated, increasing your damage will generally provide better long term results. But most of the time, if you do get a lucky mod of 4% crit chance, I wouldn't bother re-rolling it just to try to get menacing as the difference, if any, is usually pretty marginal. For defensive accessory mods, warding for plus 4 defense is obviously the best option. Now I won't do an isolated example of menacing mods versus no mods, as it is literally just a fixed increase in damage output. But here's an example of warding on all accessories versus not using Phase 2 Skeletron and his spinning head attacks in classic difficulty. First, we have getting hit without any defense boosting accessory mods. As you can see, Skeletron's spin attack is doing on average around 22 to 25 damage per hit. But slap on 5 accessories with the warding mod for an additional 20 defense, double what we started with, and it drops down to 8 to 16 damage per hit. And as an added benefit, decreasing the amount of incoming damage allows for more time for health regen to top you back up, which we'll cover in a bit. So which should you go for? Menacing or warding? Well, think of it this way. If you're getting killed by enemies before you can kill them, then more defense will let you do damage for longer. After all, a dead character does zero damage. 
But on the other hand, if you're surviving perfectly well against stuff, but it's taking forever to kill them, then most likely your defense is fine, you need more damage output. For weapon modifiers, things get much more complicated as there are a vast number of possible mods that can adjust different individual stats or even various combinations of multiple stats and the values can be good or they can be bad. But let's make it simple for you. In general, the primary focus of your weapon mods needs to be damage output, so always be on the lookout for a high damage increase, which in most cases will be 15% max. But additional factors like critical strike chance, speed, knockback, or for ranged weapons, velocity, can also be nice, and magic weapons, mana reduction can also be important. And if you're ever in doubt as to whether a given weapon deals melee, ranged, magic, or summon damage, as it's not always intuitive, just look at its tooltip and it will tell you. For melee weapons, the best modifier depends on the subtype of weapon. Melee weapons that are swung over your head, like most swords, generally benefit most from the melee and whip specific modifier of legendary. Other melee weapons, including yo-yos, maces, spears, and boomerangs, tend to benefit equally from either demonic or godly modifiers. Note that many of the weapons in this second category can't get the legendary mod anyways, as they can't get mods that increase size, which Legendary provides. For ranged weapons, the best modifier will usually depend on whether or not the ranged weapon is capable of inflicting knockback. For weapons that do have knockback, the best modifier is usually the ranged weapon specific mod, Unreal. For ranged weapons that don't have knockback, the best modifier is generally demonic. Magic weapons, like ranged weapons, will also vary based on whether they have knockback or not. But since most magic weapons do have knockback, the best mod is usually going to be the magic specific mythical mod. For the few magic weapons that don't have any knockback, the best mod is also usually demonic. And finally, for summon weapons, there are basically two types of weapons that do summon damage, those that summon your minions or sentries, and weapons that you wield that do summon damage, i.e. the various whips. For the minion and sentry summon weapons, most of the stats normally found on weapon mods don't benefit the summonses very much or at all, so the best approach is generally maximizing damage with the 18% damage boosting Ruthless mod, although any other good 15% damage mod is also perfectly decent, including Mythical. For the whips, they basically function like swords, so Legendary is the best modifier. You can also get modifiers on tools like your pickaxe and hammer, but unless you're also using it as a weapon, you want to look for increased speed with the light modifier, though legendary is also perfectly fine. So to recap, for accessory mods, shoot for warding for increased defense and menacing for increased damage output, and choose between offense or defense based on which you need more. Whips and melee swordish weapons like legendary and other melee weapons prefer demonic or godly. Ranged weapons want Unreal if they do knockback, otherwise Demonic is your go-to modifier, and magic weapons with knockback want Mythical, otherwise Demonic. Summon weapons that produce your Fire and Forget minions and sentries go full out damage with Ruthless, or anything else that's at least 15% damage boosting. Now let's shift gears from how to boost your gear to how to buff your character. There are several sources of buffs you can get in the game, ranging from those provided by gear you have equipped, potions and other consumable buffs, activated furniture buffs, and environmental buffs. I won't cover gear buffs in this video, as most of them are, expectedly, gear specific, and are generally from hard mode and late game items. But we will talk about each of the other categories in turn, but the critical thing to realize is that using these buffs in combination with others can result in massive boosts to your character's damage output, health and mana regeneration, and various other benefits that can make your life a whole lot easier. One point to remember though is that you are limited to having at most 22 buffs and debuffs active at a time, which is basically any and all icons that show up under your hotbar. Unless you've got a serious potion popping problem, that limit is unlikely to ever be an issue, but keep that in mind, for if you have a ton of buffs active, then getting hit with any debuffs will negate one or more buffs that might be active. To start out the categories of buffs, let's begin with environmental buffs. There are many items in the game that, once placed, will provide a buff to your character so long as you are in range of the buff producing item. In addition to banners, which I'll cover separately in a minute, there are six large area buffs produced by placed items, and they are as follows. The Cozy Fire buff, provided by any campfire or fireplace, 
grants a life regen and healing boost. The Happy buff is provided by Sunflowers and increases movement speed by a nice 10% and suppresses enemy spawn rates in the area. There's the Heart Lamp buff from Heart Lanterns created from Life Crystals, which provides double the health regen of the campfire and stacks with it. The Peace Candle buff from an item of the same name is crafted from Pink Gel dropped by the Pinky Slime and decreases enemy spawn rates by 23% and reduces the maximum number of enemies that can be on screen by 30%. There's the Star in a Bottle buff, also from an item of the same name and crafted from a Fallen Star in a Bottle, which boosts mana regeneration. And finally, there's the Bast Defense buff, provided by the Bast statues found in chests or fished up in crates in the desert, which adds 5 to your total defense. Each of these buffs has an area of effect centered on the item providing the buff and allowing you to go up to 85 tiles to either side and about 62 tiles above or below the item before leaving its area of effect and losing the buff. In practical terms, this means you can go a little bit off screen from the item providing the buff, but if the item goes too far off screen, you'll lose the buff. So to be safe, try to keep it in view and you'll have a little bit of a buff buffer around the edges of your screen if needed. Banners are another type of environmental buff that have the same area of effect as the ones just covered, but unlike the other buffs, all of the banners you have active in a given area are consolidated into a single buff icon and only count against one of your 22 max number of buffs. These are gained after you kill your 50th of each type of mob and each 50 thereafter, and when placed will increase your damage against that mob by 50% and reduce damage taken from the mob by 25%. These amounts are doubled in Expert Mode and Master Mode, making banners a huge benefit for fighting against invasions and events like Solar Eclipses, Martian Madness, and even the Celestial Pillars, as well as just all around great to have in any farming areas. They can normally only be hung from solid blocks, but you can hang them from platforms if you hammer the platform to be in the lower position. There's two other environmental buffs worth mentioning. The first is the honey buff provided by standing in or otherwise touching liquid honey, which gives a powerful life regeneration effect, but it only lasts for 30 seconds from leaving the honey. The honeycomb and derivative accessories also grant this buff when you get hit. A good way to incorporate honey into any fighting arena is to make a small trough that's three blocks wide and drop two buckets of honey into it. You can thereafter run across that trough to pick up the buff whenever needed. Once you're in hard mode, you can also buy bubble blocks from the party girl and make a small ring and place honey in that that you can similarly run through to pick up the honey buff. The last environmental buff isn't item based, but rather provided by the Dryad NPC. However, I generally don't try to incorporate this into any boss or event fighting arenas, as it will most likely result in her getting killed and its area of effect isn't very large anyways. Other than the Dryad, each of these environmental buffs are great to include in boss fighting arenas, farming areas, or anywhere else you're going to be killing lots of stuff. Moving on to activated furniture, there are 5 furniture items in the game that you can interact with to receive a buff, all but one of which lasts for 10 minutes. First up is the ammo box, purchased from the traveling merchant, which gives you a 20% chance per shot to not consume any ammo. Great for rangers. Note that although it looks like a bullet case and makes a gun sound effect, it also works for bows, rockets, and anything else that shoots consumable ammo. Next, the Bewitching Table increases your max number of summoned minions by one. It is found in the dungeon or, in hard mode, is sold by the Witch Doctor if the wizard has been found. This item is great for everyone as you should always have a summoned minion out anyways for the free added DPS. Next is the Sharpening Station, which increases your melee weapon armor penetration by 12. Armor penetration basically negates enemy defense, with the end result of you doing additional damage equal to half of the armor penetration amount. Or in this case, 6 additional damage per hit, assuming the target has at least 12 defense. The Sharpening Station's buff is only effective with melee weapons, but it's not a bad idea to have at least one of these in your hotbar, even with other class setups. It can be randomly found in cabins in the underground jungle and is also sold by the merchant in hard mode. And the last of the 10 minute buff items is the crystal ball which also doubles as a crafting station for a few recipes. Purchased from the hard mode wizard, it grants the clairvoyance buff which increases magic damage by 5%, magic critical strike chance by 2%, 
decreases mana cost by 2%, and adds 20 mana to your mana pool. Obviously great for all the spell slingers out there. The last quote furniture item is the slice of cake, which gives you the sugar rush buff that increases your movement and mining speeds by a decent 20%. Unfortunately, it only lasts for a small two minutes. The cake is acquired from the party girl NPC by talking to her when she's throwing a party. I generally keep one of each of these different furniture items at my base and turn them on just before venturing out. It can also be a good idea to keep some or all of these in your piggy bank or place them in areas you might be fighting for a while, such as farming arenas. The last category of buffs comes from consumables, which will split into two categories, foods and potions. For foods, there are a ton of different food items in the game that can be crafted, purchased, dropped by mobs, or that fall out of trees. All of these food items provide one of three different buffs, the duration of which can vary from as low as 1 minute to as high as 48 minutes. Here's a graphic showing what the food buffs do. On the low end, the well-fed buff is pretty decent, while plenty satisfied is better and exquisitely stuffed is absolutely amazing. Honestly, these buffs are so good that you should try to keep even the lowest one active at all times, especially in expert mode or higher, as a food buff is necessary for your life regeneration to be fully active. In addition to the how full is your stomach buffs, there are also two levels of intoxicating beverages that can be consumed. There are two drinks that can make you tipsy, ale, crafted at a keg, and sake, purchased from the traveling merchant. They actually give you a debuff of the same name that lasts for 2 minutes from ale and 4 minutes from sake, both of which decrease your defense by 4, but boost melee critical hit by 2%, and increase melee attack speed and damage by 10%. Great for the warriors out there as they charge into battle. Note that chugging lots of ale or sake will still only make you tipsy no matter how much you drink. The other intoxicating beverage is sold by the merchant, but only during the Oktoberfest event, which is only active from the end of September through October 31st. It makes you drunk for 30 seconds, during which time you will both deal and take half damage. And finally, the biggest and most varied category of all, potions. I demonstrated how to set up a basic herb garden in my For the Worthy Master Mode playthrough series, and the early game gearing video shows how to set up a basic potion making station. Links are up in the corner and down in the description if you want to see how. All told, there are, assuming I can count, 41 different buff potions that can be crafted or otherwise acquired, and 8 different flasks. All of the buff potions require a bottled water and some combination of other ingredients, such as one or more of the seven growable herbs, various fish, and other items. Durations and effects vary wildly, and I won't go over all of them here as it would simply take too long. So check the wiki for details, or just show a bottled water to the guide to see all of the in-game tooltips and crafting recipes. I will, however, talk about my favorite potions, starting with combat buffs which can make a big difference in your overall power and survivability. And they are as follows. Even in the early game, you can't go wrong with the combination of Iron Skin, Regeneration, and Swiftness. I consider these three the standard battle potions to take for boss fights and events, especially first-time attempts when you might otherwise struggle. If you're using magic weapons, two potions you'll want to mass-produce are the Magic Power Potion, which boosts magic damage by a whopping 20%, and the Mana Regeneration Potion, which provides a massive boost to your, well, mana regeneration. Rangers will want to consider the Ammo Reservation Potion, and if using bows, the Archery Potion, and Summoners, and anyone else using Summoned Minions, will benefit from Summoning Potions, which, like the Bewitching Table, increases your max minions by one. If you enjoy fishing and or have good fishing gear, you can also add the following to your repertoire, though note that some of these fish are only available in hard mode. There's the Endurance Potion, crafted with an armored cave fish, that reduces all damage by 10%. There's the Hard Mode Hollow's Life Force Potion, that increases your total life by 20%. And if you have Crimson in your world, you can make Rage Potions for 10% increased critical strike, and Heart Reach Potions for increased heart pickup range, while in the Corruption, you can make Wrath Potions for 10% increased damage. For general treasure hunting, mining, and exploration, mining and spelunker potions will significantly increase your progress rate. 
You can also add in Hunter and Danger Sense potions to help you identify open cave areas that haven't been discovered yet. Beyond that, there are a lot of utility and niche use potions, but you'll just have to visit the guide and or the wiki to see what all is available. As for flasks, these are 20 minute buffs that only affect melee weapons, but are definitely worth considering. Made at an imbuing station purchased from the Witch Doctor, unlike potions, only one can be active at a time, but also unlike potions, they stay in effect even if you die. While using a flask, any enemy hit with the melee weapon will be inflicted with a debuff. The best flask for damage is the Icker flask, but it is only available in Crimson Worlds. If you're farming money, the flask of gold can be used on enemies to increase money drops from 10 to 49% more. And note that the flask debuffs can be put onto enemies with a melee weapon, but you can then switch to your main weapons afterwards. A further reason that it's a good idea for all classes to keep a good melee weapon equipped, particularly when flasks are added into the mix. And finally, before we close out the video, here's an illustration of how powerful buffs and mods can be. In the first example, we have an early hard mode character spinning a Dao of Pal Mace against a target dummy. The weapon has no mods and he's not wearing any accessories at all. Based on our DPS meter, it looks like damage generally ranges from 230 to 240 damage per second when there aren't any crits, and spiking up to around 270 when we crit. Now here's the same character, but the weapon has been modded with godly, accessories have been modded to menacing, and we have an exquisitely stuffed food buff, we're tipsy from ale, and have a wrath potion for good measure. And looks like the damage has shot up to a minimum of 400 damage per second, but is regularly in the upper 400s, with crit spikes over 500. So yeah, just adding mods and buffs and damage output has basically doubled. Let the slaughter begin! And that's it! Again, please hit that like button and subscribe if you found the video helpful, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!